Michael. Good to see you. <laughs> you got a little job, Laura. You need something with uh, some stress and challenge. 150,000 employees, 22 countries. Um, when are you going to get a real job? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, I think this is a little bit of a therapy for all of us in this job because we get to commiserate, connect, and, um, and ideate on how we're going to do our jobs better. But before I, um, I dive into all of that, Michael, what an extraordinary keynote address. That was so inspirational. Thank I mean, you. It was amazing. Um, and I also want to give a little bit of a shout out selflessly to the Hilton team, um, both on property and our corporate team members who are here supporting and hosting you. I hope that you're all having an extraordinary stay with us. We're honored um, to be able to host you here today. So thank you to the Hilton team. Um, and, and I'll correct you, actually, we're in over 100 countries and have nearly 400,000 team members working under Hilton Flag, so just getting the facts straight. Um, but, <laughs> yeah. You know, and I run a data analytics company. <laughs> um, but, yeah, so what was the question? Sorry. I don't, <laughs> I don't remember now. Um, so, Laura, I mean, you know, we have our various lists. Uh, Hilton's always in the top you know, kind of in the land of single digits. Uh, remarkable what, what you've been able to do, and I'm going to say some things about you a little bit later. Um, uh -oh. But many companies talk about their values, you know, and, and as we know, values drive great companies and, and produce the greatness. But, you know, there's so many things that Hilton has done, but the thing that I just remember the most is where you had no business, mm -hmm. zero, no revenue, you know, hotels with crickets in them, clean crickets, I'm sure, okay, but... But that was the situation. And what did you do? Opened up a million hotel rooms because healthcare workers couldn't leave their 20-hour shift and get any rest to come back for their next 20-hour shifts. How does, the, the, how does that happen? That kind of a non-financial decision made, kind of a purpose-driven decision. Yeah, well, I think it happens thanks to great, courageous leadership, which you talked about in your keynote. Um, we are over 100 years young, I like to say. Our founder started Hilton on this bold and noble idea that we were going to fill the earth with the light and warmth of hospitality. And so that has guided us for 100 years, good times, tough times. When COVID hit, as you mentioned, our revenue dropped to zero overnight, right? And no business is built to sustain that kind of hit for a long period of time. And so in those early days, as it really started to hit us in the US, you know, it started sort of uh, in, in our Asia business. And then when it hit us in the US, we started to have daily crisis calls with the senior leadership team. And I remember very precisely because I was at home in my kitchen. It was a Saturday call, and our CEO, Chris, who you know well, you know, we were all trying to talk through how this is going to impact our owners, our team members, what do we need to do to preserve liquidity. And he said, you know, this is a moment where we need to help. And we need to help the communities that we operate in. And of course, we had all heard the devastating stories of the medical care you know, heroes in our communities. And so he challenged the team, you know, to uh, give back, to give a million rooms, to figure it out fast. Like we weren't, you know, usually a project like this could take a couple of months to figure it out. You get a task force. It was Saturday and he's like, let's have this plan in place by Monday. So the team did just that. You know, we found a partner. We partnered with Amex to do this, um, mobilized our hotels. Uh, and we're able to be a part of the solution. I think it's so important because we all have heard, I'm sure, the saying, you know, crisis builds character. And I actually prefer to think that it reveals character. It reveals who you are in the tough days because the easy days are easy. We're all running around, you know, happy-go-lucky, um, pointing to our purpose and our values. But the tough days when it really challenges you, you know, that's where you show your true colors. And I'll give you another quick example. During that time, we, of course, in hospitality, many of you are in other industries, and perhaps you were seeing, you know, peak demand, but our revenue dried up, and we had to do some of the most difficult and devastating decisions regarding our workforce, which was to furlough and lay off thousands of our team members. And what we thought we could do is partner with organizations, and some of them are in this room, who had that surge hiring to try to find new homes for our team members because we've spent so much energy and effort to recruit and develop and onboard them. We know they're amazing talent. Um, and I remember being on a call and one of my, you know, uh, a HR leader at another company said, we will welcome your team members gladly, and when they're ready to come home, they'll come back to you. And that brought tears to my eyes because it was this moment of solidarity across industries where we were all living our collective purpose to take care of the humans that 
uh, we shepherd. So yeah, our purpose is much more than words on a wall. We recruit, train, reward, celebrate people who live our values, and that was a really stark example of yeah. doing that. Great company. And uh, so based on what's going on, you know, this chrysalis that we just worked through, um, people have changed mm -hmm. in terms of what they're looking for and what they're hoping for. What have you seen? What have you experienced in terms of what people are hoping for from an employer, and how has that affected your processes at Hilton? Yeah, I mean, I'd say yes and no. So certain things for sure have changed, yeah. and they've been fueled by the clickbait, right? Yeah. So people want things really fast, right? If you're in the market for talent, you've got to move really quickly. We've accelerated our recruitment processes. They want flexibility, and I can you know, double click. I'll get on a bit of a soapbox on that in a moment. Um, and so we need to live up to this moment, right, to be relevant and to be in the market. And in addition, you know, at Hilton, we have to correct for the signal that we sent to the market when we laid off uh, our team members. So we need to tell the world, hey, we're back in business, we're hiring, and we're a great place to work, and here's why. Um, so we've had to address those challenges from a recruitment perspective. I do think, though, at their core, right, people, whether it's your father or your grandchild, they want certain transcendent human needs to be met. And I think they're telling us, and over COVID in particular, right, where our lives were fundamentally upended, the purpose of home, work, schools, like everything changed in a pretty hot talent market, hospitality notwithstanding. So that gives people sort of the leverage and courage to start asking for new and different things of employers and HR teams all over the world. But at their core, what they're saying is, I want to feel seen. I want to feel welcome. I want to be included. I want to belong. Um, I want to be able to take care of my family and myself. Right? And whether that's financial, you know, mental, physical, wellness. Uh, I want to live a self-determined life where I can grow and reach my full human potential. And that's, I want to be developed. I want to be promoted. I want to do meaningful work. And I want to work for an organization that aligns to my values and my purpose. And I think those things are not clickbait. They're not trends. They are transcendent human needs. So at the end of the day, what we're trying to solve for at Hilton is to build that human experience that meets those needs. And of course, addressing the current you know, topical, more pronounced um, needs, such as flexibility, which we all know is so important as a benefit to all of our talent. But what I'll say on that is, you know, I think the clickbait and the narrative very quickly hones in on a pretty limited view. And I think it's a very socially irresponsible view of flexibility. Flexibility. We're trying to solve on flexibility for all and primarily for our frontline and hourly team members who sacrifice their lives, their livelihoods to serve people in person throughout COVID and still do so to this day. So I don't really want to live in a world or a society and certainly not build a culture where we've got, you know, certain people who are privileged enough to boot up their laptop from anywhere in the world and demand that level of flexibility, but at the same time, they're having, you know, an aneurysm when they don't get their latte on time. Uh, and, you know, by the person who has to come in in person, right? Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> I think we, we, um, <laughs> we should work, you know, with you, and one of the transformative things that we're trying to crack is flexibility for all. And I said I wanted oat milk in my latte. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know. I know. And a gluten-free muffin. Yeah. So in terms of um, retention, mm -hmm. you know, which you just hit on the things that you do to retain people, but massive organization. So my brain just came back. I think it's like 443,000 employees. Yeah, we're getting close. Okay. Yeah. And uh, so thinking about managers and supervisors, mm -hmm. uh, making sure they're having that kind of care. What kinds of things do you do at Hilton? around where the rubber meets the road, which is that frontline supervisor and that mid-level yep. manager. Yeah, we're trying to do a lot here because these leaders find themselves at the intersection of, you know, the senior executives and the people who are delivering our business, you know, whether that be in our corporate offices or in, certainly in our hotels. And so, you know, first we start by listening to them. Right? Like, what are they telling us that they need and want? And so during uh, COVID, we actually surveyed them more than ever before. We partnered in more countries with you than ever before to make sure that we weren't losing that pulse on what it is that they need because their voice is actually what helps us design the future and unlocks a virtuous cycle of, okay, so then let's launch the programs that you need, let's amplify them with leadership, and let's make sure that we're telling those stories and allowing you know, the right usage and access. So it starts with voice. Then, of course, you know, from a wellness perspective, we do a lot to invest in 
you know, creating a safe space for them to learn and to make sure that they have the tools, especially in this evolving environment, to have vulnerable conversations about leadership, to give the righteous feedback, to make sure they can detect signs of burnout in the people that they're leading. And we've invested in development. So we uh, partnered with Guild Education to make sure that we are democratizing access to learning and that middle managers know where to point their team members to so they can upskill and reskill and multi-skill. Um, and we're trying to do you know, sort of the skill development for these managers, but also the more spiritual work of leadership development. And so we've put out you know, monthly newsletters where we have some really rich and I would say um, more spiritual exchanges on what it means to lead, what it means to recover from a mistake. How do you give someone sincere feedback? How do you become a true ally? And so that has sparked really great global conversations with our managers, general managers, helping them to find their leadership identity and to continue to you know, lead our organization and innovate in that regard. Speaking of retention, mm -hmm. I remember early, uh, you know, in the COVID experience, and we, we were talking, and I was talking to Chris before you joined. And uh, Chris is said as a CEO at Hilton, super competitive, crazy person. <laughs> and um, so we were having an a, a energetic conversation. And, uh, but one of the things he talked about was, um, you know, your predecessor, Matt Schuyler, mm -hmm. which he's got to be one of the greatest people, people of, yep. of, of all time, uh, ju just legendary in terms of what he's created and built in his career around people. And then uh, you move into his role. Mm -hmm. And so I talked to Chris about that, and because uh, we've had some really good conversations yeah, back and have. forth around diversity, yeah. equity, inclusion, and belonging. And he talked about, look, I had the opportunity to elevate, create a new experience for Matt as chief brand officer at Hilton. Gave me an opportunity to promote Laura. And he said, here's what I didn't expect. My team is better now. Now, I, he didn't mean it in a weird way, uh, okay? Meaning like, okay, my team was, and then, you know, or yep. that Laura's here, so, you know, I didn't think she, okay, it wasn't like that. It was like, it's better now. Mm -hmm. Her perspective, how she listens, her point of view, the things we didn't normally consider that we, that he just told the diversity story and the power and was very enthusiastic. To me, it was a great s situation where you've got a great situation for Matt, mm -hmm. You know, doing things. I just see, it looks like he's got a great job traveling yeah. around the world, smiling in fancy, yeah. nice hotels, and um, <laughs> and then you know, here you yeah. are, you know, uh, driving this change. So it, it's a great diversity, equity, and inclusion, and belonging story. And um, you know, the other side of that is that you're Laura Fuentes. That last name. Mm -hmm. You know, you're a role model now, whether you want to be or not. It comes along with it. I was so happy when you got the job. I'm just happy to see a woman get elevated. I'm happy to see a woman of color get elevated, okay? These, these things, they just don't happen. You know what I'm talking about. We just celebrate um, when, when these things happen. And I celebrate Chris, too, yeah. for, for um, you know, um, what seems like a, it's a right decision, but it, it, it takes some courage to make the kinds of changes. But um, do you feel more pressure as a woman of color in a top role. Um, I mean, I know how I feel. We won't get into that. You heard about it. But how do, how do you feel? Um, do you feel more pressure? Yeah, that is such a meaningful question. And I will say I feel a huge amount of responsibility, urgency. I feel a sense of honor and pride to do this work. And of course, I bring to the table certain lived experiences as a woman, as a mom, uh, as an immigrant to the US um, that I want to speak up for. I know what it feels like to be the only you know, woman, the only person of a certain background in a room, especially early in my career. And I feel like the promise of diversity is when these you know, underrepresented minorities, you know, women, get to the tables we strive for, if we don't speak up, then what's it all for, right? So I will never stop speaking up for the women of Hilton, the women of the world, you know. I'm very passionate about topics of fairness. I'm a middle child, so I'm always seeking, you know, fair outcomes, have been since I was born, you know, uh, or since my brother was born, I should say. And, um, you know, and so to me, I feel like 
that is always going to be part of my identity. Now, that being said, it is also my job to make sure that I achieve fair outcomes for everyone because I cannot pretend that I speak for all women. You know, my experience is very different than other people on the executive committee, than other people at our company. I had the support and love of my parents. I had financial stability growing up. There are other people, you know, my colleagues who had very different lived experiences and they're representing other voices. I also know and appreciate the burden that we put on minorities and women to represent, to fight the fight, to, you know, we task like our black leaders to go do more recruiting, to get more, you know, black leaders. And I know that puts an extra burden on, you know, those minority, you know, uh, team members and leaders. Um, but that being said, there's a different burden, and I'm sure the white men in this room are feeling, right, to make sure that they're fighting the fight and driving these advances and equitable outcomes. So to me, the beautiful thing here is we all need to work together to make this happen. And we should feel a huge sense of pressure but urgency because I like to say, look, this is the work of many lifetimes, right? I mean, you took us through a beautiful timeline showing us just that. Uh, but we need to be committed in our lifetime to driving some real meaningful progress. You also asked the audience earlier, like, you know, do we have any allies in the house? And there was a lot of cheering, and that's great. I love that sense of pride. But, you know, we don't self-impose the honor of allyship, right? That is something that is earned and bestowed upon us by the people we fight for and speak for based on our track record of success and impact. So unless you're, you know, achieving the results for others, like you don't call yourself an ally, they will tell you, right? They will yeah. declare that judgment day and whether or not you're doing the yeah. good work. Um, so I hope to be a good ally. I hope to make the women and men of Hilton proud. And I hope to achieve the outcomes for all that everyone deserves. Because at the end of the day, you know, our people are not stats. They are stories, they are souls who deserve to be seen, rewarded, recognized, promoted, and who deserve to lead. So that's what I'm always going to be passionate about and fight really hard for. And by the way, you know, I'm glad that white men feel that sense of urgency and commitment. You mentioned Chris and Matt. They did great things for me in my career, and they were sponsors and mentors and teachers to this day. I seek their advice for sure. And, you know, they felt that sense of commitment. So I hope that whether you are in an underrepresented group or in a majority group, man or woman, um, that you are doing that work. And I think if you're at this conference, you know, this is why we're here. Yeah, that's exactly why we're here. Yeah. And so, yeah, let's have it. You know, so here we are looking forward, you know, based on higher interest rates, Looks like here to stay. Mm -hmm. um, you know, my sons are having their first experience of their life of having a friend who lost a job. Mm. You know, it's like, so and so lost a job. I like, I've been telling you. Mm -hmm. Okay, but finally, something's happening that they haven't experienced. Um, you know, in, in their young, in their young career, uh, we've got inflation mm -hmm. and, and all the things that we know are going on in the world. Running a big business, um, and. Uh, so, in terms of your top three, what are you thinking about in terms of your people heading into these headwinds, the things that you want to make sure you're doing well, and all the leaders, supervisors, and managers are doing well? You know, we want to make sure that, you know, we are continuing to invest in creating a human experience at work, right? So that people feel included, that they are part of a healthy organization, that they're developing, and that they're connected to purpose. So that is part of our life cycle commitment to anyone who joins uh, and works at Hilton. We want to make sure, of course, that we are retaining folks, right? And so it's every step of that experience, but that they also feel inspired. And it sounds a little bit trite, and we you know, call it something fancier, like a global engagement strategy. But honestly, like, having fun at work, right? Like, do you have friends at work? Are you having fun? You know, I think the future of work is actually food, fun, and friends, and maybe some puppies thrown in the mix, and we <laughs> did that yesterday um, with our immersion. But, um, you know, I read a study recently that said uh, there is a certain magical number, actually, and you're all going to start doing the mental math, of folks who have at least seven friends in the workplace are much more likely 
likely to stay and succeed, right? And we've all sort of self-isolated and retreated into these bunkers of survival over the last couple of years, right? Out of fear, out of convenience, perhaps. But we want to, you know, start having fun again as a company and, and be allowed to have fun because we were going through so much sustained trauma that it almost felt you had to ask permission for that. I've just come off a bit of a global tour. We were in Singapore a couple weeks ago and London last week celebrating and bringing back our general managers together. And yes, breaking bread and eating together and, and finding nourishment literally and figuratively as we gathered again. And it was fun. Work can be fun. I mean, work is intense and purposeful and meaningful, but it was also so joyful. And that is a huge element of the human experience when you think about our days on earth as limited as they are you know you want to leave this world a better place and you want to leave it uh, having made an impact but you also hopefully have extraordinary memories with the people that you loved and a lot of that is going to happen at work um, so I don't want to pretend here that you know Hilton even as large as our footprint is and as committed as we all are that we can eradicate you know, racism, sexism, xenophobia, homophobia from the world, but we can make a dent. And together here, we can make a bigger dent. So that's what we're trying to inspire our leaders to be committed to that work, to deliver on a human experience for all of our team members, to have fun at work and bring that joy back. And I think that is going to make it a great place to work, um, but also just a great place and we'll together build a greater world. My friend Chris Sutter is very, very lucky. Let's oh. have a round of applause for Laura Fuentes. <laughs> Thank you.